Welcome to another amazing podcast from Encounter City Church. To stay connected, you can find us on Facebook or go to www.encountercitychurch.com.au. We pray that you have a fresh encounter with Jesus today. All right, let's have a look into what we're starting a mini series called The Mind Does, Does Matter. And next week we've got Mother's Day. The following week we'll finish this off. And so let me read a scripture to you Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And this is the amplified version, which means that it's been enlarged and, and um, extra words put in to help explain. Uh, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, and intelligent I'm sorry, consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable or rather rational intelligence service and your form of spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adopted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed or changed by the entire renewal of your mind with its new ideals and new attitude. So you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. I think growing up over my life, all the times that I ask as a teenager, all the times when I go with um, uh, young adults and even with older people saying, I still don't know what God wants me to do. Silence. Don't let the mask silent you. It is a question that every Christian has and asks. And sometimes I think it actually gets quite, it's been complicated because we're looking for this, what they, what, we think the perfect will of God is. And the perfect will of God is not a thing you get to do. It's a position you have in relationship with Him. And so I, I, I finish. I could finish with that right now. But that's my end. And so I want to introduce something today where it takes you on that journey of where you can be secure in who you are in God. That's what the perfect will of God. It's not about the job you get to do. It's about your walk with God. So let's just unpack this in an introduction. Next week, we'll get more, uh, sorry, in two weeks time, I'll be more practical as we discuss more about the renewing of the mind. But here to understand the mind does matter in this place, in this scripture. We are spiritual beings of a heavenly fixture, but what we think does matter. I was raised in Pentecostal church my whole life, which was very spiritual and very supernatural in its emphasis. And well, I thank God for that. But one thing that, we were, that was ignored was the ability to think and to study and to use your mind to control your life and take, take control of your life. And so uh, we got to, it's not an and or it's not an or situation. It's an and situation. This is one of the most significant verses I believe in the Bible. Not only its content, but its actual location points us to why it's so significant. Because it gives an importance that we need to embrace. See, Romans is the doctrinal book of the New Testament. This is where you unpack the doctrines and theologies of Christianity or the grace walk with Jesus. Paul writes to the Romans in this book, the truth about God and our salvation. He unpacks or explains man's sinfulness and God's right to judge and therefore God, also God's provision of love, grace, salvation, righteousness and mercy. He unpacks his and our struggle, his own struggle with sin, but also the power and the freedom available in Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit. So these are all unpacked in this amazing book. The first 11 chapters unpacks all of that. Basic doctrine of a Christian walk. And then we have the last five chapters, which are the chapters of practicalities or working out practically those things we've just discovered theoretically or not theoretically, theologically in the 11 chapters before that. How to live according to the doctrine of grace and what God's done. And in between these two sections of the Romans are these two verses that link the theology and the doctrine to the practical working out. We can't move from doctrine to everyday living without applying what's in these two verses. 
the lack of application of these two verses explains so often why if you've been around a while, many Christians are on their way to heaven, but meanwhile are living a hell on earth. Massive mental problems and health issues and all kinds of doubts and fears and anxieties and negativity, speech that is rotten and toxic. It's because these two verses have been ignored for so long. Paul is showing how to make a doctrine a reality, how our salvation is worked out and how the inner work becomes an outer work in our lives. He is reinforcing again that God works from the inside out. He works from inside out, which is the opposite from the world, which is also all about outside in. That's why social media is so popular, because it's all about the outside, the outside, look at me, look at me, how wonderful that is. So as an introduction to this two-part series, I just want to unpack the, uh, these verses in a broad, general sense before we get in the two weeks' time into practicalities of it. So first thing I want to really highlight is that first, in that first verse, Romans 12, 1, in another version, says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. If you want the first step of living out the doctrine and theology of Jesus Christ and His salvation, that means salvation means you have to give everything. It's not a token gesture. It is not about saying a simple prayer. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I repent of my sin. Now I'm on my way to heaven. That's why we end up living hell on earth, if that's all that it is to be saved. He's passionate. If you read his language here, he's passionate and urging everyone to respond more than just with a, a prayer, but to apply and dig deep and give everything you've got to the master, to the king of kings, the one who's given everything he had to us. And if we want to see the rest of that will of God, this is the starting point of understanding the will of God. So many ask the question, but they won't prepare themselves or put themselves in the hand of the one that wants to open the door for them. Last minute during worship, I had this picture of what, how to present this to you. And so I asked Caro, she'd quickly nip upstairs and find me some clay or some plasticine that I, or, or something like that that I could show you. But... Oh, we're so good up there that we got rid of all that stuff during COVID. So um, I don't have it. But I, the picture, I, I just felt in worship to present to you. That it, we see that in, in, in the Old Testament describes that we are like the, uh, bits of clay that are put on the master's, in the master's potter's hand. We put on the, the, the wheel that he works on and spins us around and he turns and he works and he massages us and he prepares us. But the only way the master can actually work on the piece of clay is if the clay is sitting on the potter's wheel. And this is what he's saying. Guys, if you want to see all of this doctrine and all of this theology, all of this truth applied in your life, you're actually going to be where the master is, where it can work in your life, where it can be massaged in. You can't just say, I'll have you over there, God, and then I'll have this over here. He's saying, give your whole body, body, soul, and spirit presented to the master. We see in the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What were they? They said, we're not going to eat what you eat because we actually don't want to bow down to your world and lifestyle and your culture and your way of thinking. And so test us and prove that our God is good. And so they refused to bow and they ate the vegetarian. I don't understand all that stuff, but thank goodness it was the Old Testament. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> and God made them sharper and smarter and they were flourished as they trusted God with their whole being. And then when the whole world or the whole empire was bowing to the king, they said, we don't bow to any other king. We bow to one king. His name is God. And what happens? They're thrown into the fire because they presented their bodies as holy, acceptable, living sacrifices to God. And guess what happened in the fire? They got worked on and they were transformed and they had an encounter with Jesus. They didn't say, well, you know what? When I first came into captivity, we actually did a good thing back then. We decided that we wouldn't eat the fruit and we wouldn't eat all the rich foods. And so God came through. We were a testimony back then and we've done our bit. And right now, you know, what's, what's it hurt if I just bow? You know, you know, everybody knows I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to bow. No, 
their whole life was presented, not just one instant, one moment, one time, their whole life. Right now, if you are wondering why the rest of my life isn't working out, is your whole life presented or just part of it? See, what's on the altar, what's on the potter's will is what get God gets to work on. He never forces you. You weren't, weren't forced to be saved. You were presented the gospel. Holy Ghost convicted you. You made the choice and you continue to make the choice. Will I stay? Will I be on the altar? Will I let him work in me, massage me, correct me, strengthen me, grow me? Cause me to flourish so that I actually are an example of all of the truth of chapter of the first chapters. I actually get to shine and be a light because I am transformed. But it starts with presenting everything my marriage, my children, my finances. Tithing is part of that. You can talk grace to the cows, come home. But the truth is. That is an element. God says, I give you all this, but I'm going to keep this. So you will learn to trust and walk in faith and trust in me. No, I don't want to give you that bit. God, my goodness, no. That bit's, I found a way out of that one. Found some kind of. Anyway, I'll get upset somebody. This is present. See, you know what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost? That even hurts me right now. God, who is in you, whom you have received from God. So God, the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit is wanting you to present every part of what he is in. He's in you. And so therefore, you with him needs to be presented and allowed God the master, to work on you. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. End of story. You don't like my preaching, then like you don't like the Bible. She says, living sacrifices, we better move on. Uh, and so let's have a look. at it. The second thing I want to highlight is that when he starts to talk about that we are, need to renew our minds. And I just call this thinking matters. Thinking does matter. The way we think is critical to the way we live. Every action we do in our life is preceded by a thought, whether subconscious or deliberate, a thought determines your action. Therefore, the thinking patterns determine your actions and way of life. It is important. And this is where we, we introduce the need for renewing of our thinking patterns, which we'll, we'll work on in a couple of weeks' time. But our thinking is what brings the reality of the new person into everyday living, where chapter 11, the first chapter 11, has become into our everyday living. See, Paul is very aware of Christians going to heaven, but at the same time not living in victory. And so a lot of his writings, a lot of his letters, are dealing with that. Christians unable to live in victory even though they're born again because their thinking has not been renewed. Over the years, I've actually, sorry to say this, when we are born again, this is a really old term. If you've been around a long time, you'll know this. If you're a new Christian, you go, what on earth are you talking about? But I'm going to use these two terms. When we're born again, we are justified. Justified just as if I never sinned. Washed in the blood of Jesus, that's how I remember from Sunday school, that washed in the blood of Jesus so that my sins are washed away. So instantly I am justified in Jesus. On my way to heaven, I have a new walk. My spirit is alive, it connects with God, and I can hear from God, I'm a new creation. But the process of being made in the image of Christ is a process called sanctification. All the oldies got not the heads. If you can't speak beyond your mask, you can still not get and those who don't know just go, great. That means you're new Christians. Hey, Zach, that's cool, mate. Lap it up, pal. It's good stuff. It's a process where we work our salvation out. Here he uses the continual process verb of renewing our minds. It's a continuing process verb. Do you know what a verb is? Who remembers a verb? Doing word. Do they still teach kids that way? Doing words, describing words. 
doing word. It's a process. Over the years, I've used this analogy, um, and that is that, and for those who like cars, you're going to like this one, but can you imagine uh, a car that has got the most powerful motor that you can picture? All right? And you, everybody will have their own car, favourite car in there. And so you've got this car with a large V8 motor in there. When I first got here, Pastor Dan had an SS Commodore, it's a bit of cheap junk that he was driving around for his work. Now he went downgraded to a Jeep. And so... Um, <clears throat> So says the guy of a patrol, okay. <laughs> and the Volkswagen. <laughs> Should we create the enemies today and compare cars? <laughs> but just picture, the car, picture the, the car with this massive engine. So much power. A V8 that's pulling out 350 horsepower. It's just amazing that can just do zero. I would have put my own favorite car. It's a 963, um, which I just forgot. Chevy Impala. That's the car that I'd love to own. If you're anyone feels rich and wants to buy me one, all black, and just sits there. Boom, 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 boom. You put, park up in my dreams, I park up alongside, I come to church, and I park up, boom, 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 and just there. It's just, boom, 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 boom. it's just got power. And my hair's on the back of my head, neck, and um, <laughs> it goes straight up. Adrenaline is buzzing and all the men come ready. Oh, man, Pastor, that is so cool. And it's got power, sound, testosterone. <laughs> but do you know what? It can have all of that in there, but the only way it will get to church is not just because of the engine, but it has a tail shaft and a gearbox, and an axle, and four wheels, and a differential, a little differential. Is that right? It has all these other hidden things that transmit the power of that motor into the wheels of that vehicle so that that vehicle can be all that it was created to do. When you are born again, have encounter with the living God, you have so much potential of the, the unlimited power of God living and dwelling inside of you. Your spirit now can connect with God's spirit. You have this, but it only gets out by this hidden factor, gearbox, tail shaft, diff, and axle called the mind. The link between all that's going on in here is this thing in here. And so it's so critical between, in this section of the bump, the link between all the truth and grace and salvation and victory that God has given us to the practical living out is how to renew our minds. Here's a couple of thoughts about that as introductions for two weeks' time. Regeneration of our spirit is what God does. When we're born again, we repent and God regenerates our spirit. Renewing the minds is what we do. And the result is a transformation of your whole life. One plus one equals two in this case. Renewing our minds is an ongoing process. It's not an event. Salvation is an event when I say that. It's one off, you know, in the sense that you're born again. Born again, you, you say the prayer and you are believe it and you are born again. You're justified. But this renewing of the mind, this transformation process, it, it's a process. It's a little bit like adoption. The Bible describes our salvation as being adopted and heirs into his family. Adoption occurs when you search. You know, my, I've shared the story of my nephew being adopted into his family. And you, there's a search goes on. There's checks, there's inquiries, there's questions, there's interviews that take place. Then eventually there is a release form and, or maybe a court signs it over and there's a signature and that child becomes a new creation as they are adopted into a new family. But as I've described, the journey after that is that they may be adopted and have a new inheritance and are heirs but there's a process of them identifying with that and being transformed. As they develop and as they learn the new speech and they learn the, rule, the values of that family, these things don't change. They need to be constantly changed. I want to show you a video. I've talked about my nephew. 
So I'm going to show you a quick message. I got permission today, rang my brother. Can I show you this little video that he presented to my dad on his 80th birthday a couple of weeks ago? And I thought, just see this for a second. All right. Um, happy birthday, you know, um, I'm thankful that you've been praying over me. That, that I want, that I wish we were there to celebrate your birthday. Well, that would be good. That could be my first time to go to Australia. And I hope we can go the next year to come visit all of your, all of your uh, grown kids and to um, spend time with them. Pretty cool. Let me just describe, you can see that he's adopted. <laughs> He comes from an outback part of China, thrown into a fire as a child and abandoned into an orphanage with hundreds of other children. You can't see all of that, but when he was come back to America, he was actually like that, scar tissue running all the way down into his neck because of all the burns and down into his back and all over. He actually is quite intelligent, even though his speech is broken. Part of that is, they think, because of some damage that was done on nerves and that, and they're still exploring that. So he was adopted for a lot of searching, signed up and became McCourt. His name was changed to Joseph from some other name I don't know how to pronounce. And he had to learn his journey and learn his way. When, I, when he first came here, he's 12 now. His voice is broken and uh, he's 12. And he uh, learnt, he had no English, only spoke Mandarin, crippled because of the burnt tissues and hung up in, he only ever ate noodles. And as I've described to you, that he used to stuff his mouth, even though he had a full house and a full belly, he would still stuff tissues into his mouth because that was the habit of, that he had adapted and adopted when he was a child in an orphanage. But now, six, seven years later, at 12 years of age, he speaks English. He wrote that. His mum and dad didn't tell him what to write. They're all his writings. He will hug and he will talk. He eats, well, I don't know if he eats, knowing Mark, he won't eat his vegetables, so Mark doesn't. But he is eating more than noodles. He's got a wonderful house and large property he lives on. He has a whole new future in a career and a business world that he can embrace that was never his to embrace until he became adopted. But you know what? That's a seven-year journey to that, and the journey continues. The secret is you never ever give up. The secret is you keep embracing. I have a chance. I have been given another opportunity. I have been forgiven. I've been adopted. I am now a heir and heir and I'm going to run with what I have been given. I present myself because of all these mercies and run with what I've been given. And so I go on this journey of renewing my mind so it can work itself out in every area of my life. Renewing the mind is the process by which my soul is saved. My spirit has been born again, but my soul, which is my will and my mind and my emotions, needs to be renewed. That's the soulish area of your life. 1 Thessalonians first, uh, chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blamelessly at the coming of our Lord Jesus. The soulish area separate to the spirit. I know uh, in our English we mix it up and in some languages it gets mixed up. But I'm talking about this soulish area which dictates so much of how you live. Your mental health and your physical and all that comes out of that area. Salvation of spirit. The real man is a work of grace and not something we can achieve in ourselves. But the soul man being born again or being saved, I should say, is something we do through this process of renewing. Ephesians 2 of transformation. Ephesians 2 says this in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So that's our justification. Then I talked about sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, this process of working our salvation out, it is the power of God. Now let me just say, there's not one person in this room from the oldest person 
to the youngest that has worked it all out. It's complete when you get to heaven. The bottom line is, then that means a lot of confidence because even I, I stand here and preach every week, I am constantly working stuff out. I know you're amazed by that and you think perfection stands here, but it's not. <laughs> Man, I'd shock you if I told you all the things that are wrong with Tracy and she works herself out. My wife said, stop bagging yourself. So I said, I'll bag you then. Okay, no, no. <laughs> it's a team effort, babe. <laughs> Philippians 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Soul salvation is not a prerequisite for eternal life, Okay but the response of the work of the Spirit of God in our spirit. It's why God, Paul calls it transformation. Salvation and then transformation. Salvation, then transformation. Renewing the mind is a major weapon and battleground in spiritual warfare. We need, to, that's where a lot of the fighting takes place. The devil's major weapon right at the beginning was deception and lies. And it's still there today. So our minds need to be geared up to what the, what the world is asking us to conform to, but what the Word of God is revealing. So when we renew our minds according to the Word of God, that determines the culture and the kingdom thinking. Therefore, we have weapons that, we, that reveal the enemy's tactics. See, we may, have to, and it, we may get attacked physically. The enemy may bring something that attacks your body. Cancer may hit it. But where I have control, where you have control, is what our mind, how that responds to the attack of the enemy. That's ours. Renewing the mind is not positive thinking. It's correct thinking. Psychologists will tell us the power of positive thinking over negative thinking. And I'm not anti all of that. Better than being negative. All right? So if you've got a starting point, be positive. Because being negative is toxic, destroying, and soul-destroying, and really makes you very, very ugly. You can be a really pretty person, but you've got a negative mouth. Guess what? You suddenly become ugly. Thank you. (laughs) You're beautiful in both ways, okay? But in Scripture, there isn't such a thing as negative and positive as such. In fact, positive thinking, though generally good and extreme, will become error and can lead to denial of situations that need to be dealt with. But we, need, but we learn, we think correctly, which is the way God thinks. That's called correct thinking. Correct thinking is based on God's Word, and positive thinking is based really on what I want for me. Renewing the mind is required for our heart to be complete and prosper. The Bible talks about that we, the soul and spirit of man makes up the heart of man. When you hear the term, the heart of man is evil, or when the heart, that as a man thinks in his heart, so will he be, it's the combination of that soul and spirit that makes up the man. And so as that soul and spirit is healthy, so shall the man be healthy. If the soul and spirit of man is, uh, is, is unregenerated and untransformed and toxic, so the actions and the result of a man's life will be toxic. The soul, the emotions, the wills and thoughts and the spirit, they make up the heart of a man. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, above everything else, everything else, everything else, everything else, guard your heart. The spirit and soul being of you because out of it springs all the issues of life. Does that make sense? See, the, the untransformed mind, the wrong renewed, the wrong thinking explains why so many believers have no peace because their soul is not prosperous through the renewing of their mind. We also, and we'll talk more about this in a couple of weeks, we need to stop conforming as much as we need to be renewing. They actually need, what will take place we pay, is that there needs to be repentance, removal, and replacement. Not just replacing, just adding something to something that's already toxic because actually what you're adding something to something that's toxic, the toxicity will get through to the something you've just added to. There needs to be a remove, a repentance, a removal, and a replacing. And we're not just going after, we're not talking about behavior modification. 
If you want to cut down a tree, we've got to get that tree trimmed out there. And to me, I'm a man that just says, just remove it out of sight so it never comes back again. Grind it down, remove it. But we've got some nice people in our church who said we not like that tree outside, but it's hitting the bow lines. So they've had sway over me in my practical thinking. But if I wanted to cut down that tree and get rid of it, because it's a pain, it's not a pain, it's a nice tree. Did nothing wrong. I don't go and cut a tree, I don't cut a branch. Do I? Yeah, let's cut the tree, let's pull the fruit off, let's cut one branch, and the tree will go. Of course not. So why are we, ta- we don't, we're not talking about going after the behaviour today. We're not talking about, oh, you've got something wrong in your life or you're doing something. I'm not here to go and attack all that. I'm going to the soul of the matter, to the heart of the matter, the core of the matter. And then when that is ripped out, when repentance takes place, that is removed. We replace with the Word of God and His renewed thinking. And finally, the third, that's all about renewing. The final point I want to make is that, and therefore we will know the perfect will of God in our lives. The perfect will under God is not a job you're going to get. It's the experience of walking in His grace and His love, of knowing Him. So you live with a green light in your life because I'm abiding in the vine. And when I'm in the vine and my brain is abiding, my thinking is abiding with that, I'm going to produce the fruit that I'm abiding in. When I'm resting in God and I've removed the the toxicity toxicity, and I've moved and replaced it with the Word of God, the, the rest of Romans 12, which we talked about a few weeks ago, starts to unpack and make sense. You discover these gifts that the Father has given you. And so you walk in those gifts that you've got, not what somebody else has got. See, if I don't have a renewed mind, I'm wanting what somebody else has got. And when I want somebody else has got and I'm not equipped to do what somebody else has got, I am actually creating chaos and I'm in for a big smackdown. WWF smackdown to extreme. Every wrestler ever in existence on top of you, smacking you down to an extreme. And you can't get up because you are trying to be something you weren't created to do. So chill. Chill. Find the word, finding the perfect will of God is replacing, repenting, replacing with what He's given us. Simple. A lot. You know what it's like? And I, I think Pastor David Storer might have done this when we were away in December. But it, he was the one that highlighted to me. It's one of the reasons why I dress so sloppy today. But my dad would say I dress sloppy every Sunday. But, uh, but it's like this in our lives. I can't even do it. Buttons up anymore. There you go. All right. I've done my button up. Now, I was going to get up on stage and do this, but for some of you OC, OCD people, you would never have seen, heard a word I said today. I feel like Michael McIntyre when he put on so much weight, he, could, he can't lift his jacket up anymore. And uh, if you've seen that video. But you know what? You think that everybody here who's ever worn a shirt, or maybe not quite to this extent, but sometimes you get the first wrong, hole wrong. You get the button in the first hole. Maybe it's like early in the morning, you got dressed in the dark and you put on, or you weren't looking or you weren't thinking. All of a sudden you've got the wrong hole with the wrong button. Don't you dare take a photo of this. Sir. It's okay. But what happens after that? You don't notice it at first, but then the next hole is out. Then the next hole is out and eventually everything's out and you look like an idiot like I look like. Don't you dare take photos of me, you don't. But it started just the first hole. It starts with salvation and it continues if you're not saved that everything is out. It's why the world can live in the gifts that God has given them, but make a mess of the world. Because it starts with repentance, then replacing. Sorry, then removing and then replacing. 
this morning as every head is bowed and every eye is closed and I get rid of this look I really want to encourage the perfect will of God for your life is something God created you to have it's walking and knowing and resting in Him but it starts it starts it starts with getting that first hole right getting that first button right it starts with you repenting and coming into his life, him coming into your life. This morning, the Holy Spirit is here. I've talked, but now he's talking. And he will be convicting you to say that your life is out of order. And you're wondering about the will of God or just wondering about what my purpose is. Well, your purpose is to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. You were created to walk in unity with God. And so God sent Jesus to die so the sin that blocks you from God could be removed out of your life once and for all, washed clean, and instantly you are walking and talking to God. But it needs you to receive what He's given you. It needs you to repent. It needs you to say, God, I'm, I, I, I can't and I've done it wrong. Forgive me of my sin. I now receive your payment your forgiveness of my sin. And this morning, if the Holy Spirit right now is convicting you to realign your life, maybe you've never been a Christian. Maybe you've a visitor here today and with masks on, I can't recognise everybody here. But maybe this is your moment and you've never made that decision. We'll make the decision this morning that Jesus Christ is going to become my Lord and Saviour. I'm going to repent and follow Him. I'm going to replace and, 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 and uh, remove and replace. But right now, the first point is I'm going to repent and receive Him into my life. That is you this morning. Maybe it's my, not, maybe you might be backslidden. Maybe your alignment, your, you suddenly clicked when I did that stupid shirt thing. You went, wow, that's my life. Nothing's lining up because the third and bu- first button is out of order. I haven't presented my life on the altar. I've only just got Jesus as Saviour and that's all. And I'm living everything else wrong. But God says, get back. And He's talking to you that has made that decision. Or maybe you're backslidden. Or maybe you're just not sure. You're just not sure. Maybe you're raised in the church and just had a religious experience, but not a relationship with Jesus. If Holy Spirit right now in your heart, it's right now. I'm not convincing you. The Holy Spirit is convicting you in your heart right now that you need to say yes to Him. I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm just here to pray for you. If that is you right now across this room, I'd love you to lift your hand. Last time, we regularly see this happen a few weeks ago. Last time we met, someone gave their heart to the Lord. Anybody else here that wants to give their heart to Jesus, follow Him, realign their life and get it back in order. Present your body as living, holy, acceptable sacrifice to Jesus. This morning, if that is you right now, just lift your hand and we're going to pray. All the whole church is going to pray together. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray. This morning, realign. Maybe you're just not sure. Maybe you've gone out of kilter. You know, you, follow, you, you love Jesus and you're saved, but right now you know you haven't been following, that his, my life is not presented on the altar. It's not on the potter's will for him to shape. If that is you, just lift your hand so I can pray with you this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see those hands. I see those hands. Let God work on you right now. You can put those hands down. We're going to all stand right now. There's others, I reckon, in this room. The God is just speaking to you right now. And that's okay. We're not going to, we're not going to for, for all the rules that are around, we're not going to be praying for people at the front today, but we're going to pray for you in your seat right now. See, God saw your hand. I saw it, but God, more importantly, saw your heart that's attached to the hand. And so I'd like our whole church to right now pr- pray. This prayer will be a prayer of repentance for those that have never made the decision and for those that are reconnecting and realigning their shirts right now. So would you all, to support one another and to support those that might be embarrassed and those at whatever stage they're at, would you all pray this prayer with me because we love God so much and we love each other so much. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you to realign my life to repent of my sin, to receive Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. 
heal me of my broken heart and help me in my journey ahead. As I receive today your mercy, your forgiveness and your kindness and your love and your grace and your inheritance. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Is that pretty cool? Isn't God good? God good? Thank you. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering right now. Realignments. Let me just say, just hit me just then. You know, have you ever been wearing your shirt wrong? Husbands, I'm talking to you right now. You've never done that. Oh, get out. You're lying. Okay. And it's your wife that's pointed it out? Ever done? Who's been that guilty of that? Thanks, Zach. Zach and I are the only two. Oh, good. A couple more. You know what? Sometimes others see what we don't see. So if you think you're you're out of alignment, others will see. All right? They do see. And you know what? But they still love. They still grace. They still married me. No matter how stupid I look today. And that's the church. We're here to help you in the journey. Be planted. Be planted. Get your roots deep so we can love and care and nourish you, help you with that shirt. Be blessed. We're not going to be praying for people. We're not going to finish your song because of the time and also where we are with rules and all that right now. But we are going to, I'm still going to have my coffee. They're not ever taking, not taking Jesus from me and they're not taking my coffee from me. All right? So, would I have got a clap if I just said Jesus? It was at the coffee bed. Shame on you lot. So we're going to go, we're going to pray. We're going to uh, have a cup of coffee. I'm going to pray for everybody right now across this place. Actually, if you need a touch in your, we didn't pray for the sick today. But if you need a touch in your body, could you just lift your hand and we're going to pray for you. He needs a miracle, needs a miracle, needs a miracle. Who needs a miracle in their body right now? All right. Those around you can reach out and touch you. Are you Clinton? Hey, dude. Good to see you, mate. Didn't see you under the mask. He's the guy that's going to cut our tree down. No, it's not. <laughs> Trim it for us, aren't you, Clinton? Accidentally. Okay, bless you, pal. Good to have you in church. Father, right now across this room, people need a miracle in their bodies. You know the miracle. You are the healer. You are the power. And it's by Jesus' stripes we are healed. And today, right now, pray for the trans performing healing power of the Holy Ghost to touch their bodies as the blood and the broken body of Jesus has already paved the way right now. Be healed in Jesus' name across this room. Amen. Amen. So guys, don't forget tonight, 5.30, we're going to have a, uh, we, we use this part of the building. We're going to have a um, uh, our evening service. And then um, don't forget Mother's Day next week. Mother's Day in life groups. So have a great afternoon. Go and grab a cup of coffee and uh, be blessed. And you uh, expect you back tonight.